Joining us now, a leader of the Stop Trump movement, Ken Blackwell, the former Ohio Secretary of State, who is now a senior advisor to the Stop Trump PAC called Our Principles. Also with us, the man who many credit with stopping Trump in Wisconsin, Charlie Sykes, the Wisconsin radio talk show host, whose interview with Donald Trump changed the campaign dynamics in Wisconsin. Also with us, Steve Schmidt, who was the senior campaign strategist and advisor to John McCain's 2008 presidential campaign. He's an MSNBC political analyst. And joining us from the Republican National Committee, Lindsey Walters, who is the national spokesperson for the RNC. Uh, Lindsey, you have a job like no other before you. The RNC is in the center of the storm I just described. It's something no party has had to deal with before. Normally, the Republican Party, and at this stage, the Democratic Party apparatus, are neutral. They are officially neutral when there's a primary going on. How do you maintain both that image of neutrality for the party and the the belief among Republican voters that you really are being neutral when you have one uh, candidate out there all the time saying it's rigged and the bosses are rigging it. The RNC is here to be the facilitator in this process. You know, the primary process and the delegate selection comes down to the individual states and their state party rules. And so how delegates are allocated and elected and selected in the different states is all determined upon what those state party rules say. And so here at the RNC, we're just to ensure an open, fair, and transparent process as we head into the convention, and then we come out of the convention with a nominee. But the, the with this perception the, or this argument that's being made out there that some how these rules are deliberately written by the bosses, as the argument goes. They're deliberately written to confuse. They're deliberately written to be hard to follow. Uh, what is your response to that? These are rules that were written last year, submitted to the RNC, and then made available to all of the campaigns and the candidates. And it's up to the individual campaigns, candidates, and their staffs to ensure that they understand this process. And this is not easy. This process is an organizational, it's huge, and you have to understand it. And that's on behalf of the campaigns and the candidates to ensure that they know this information has been available since last October. Ken Blackwell, why did you get into the Stop Trump movement? Essentially, I think the Republican Party has to be a conservative alternative to the more liberal Democratic Party. Donald Trump is not a conservative, and he's only recently become a Republican. He has supported uh, liberal Democratic candidates, including Hillary Clinton. And so this is a process to establish uh, our principles and to make sure that our standard bearer is true to our principles. But it's been fascinating to watch the Trump campaign. They're using what I call the old Billy Martin, you know, go out and harass, get in the umpire's head. And so he runs out and he kicks dirt all over the umpire to get in the umpire's head to try to get the umpire to give him a break sometime later in the game. Uh, and that's what he's doing. But there are those of us who have been around the bases a couple of times ourselves. And we're going to, in fact, play by the rule book. And we're going to go into Cleveland. And I think that we're going to stop Trump from getting the... 1237 that he needs. Charlie Sykes, uh, as I said, many credit you with stopping Trump's momentum, certainly in Wisconsin. Uh, Trump lost that state. It was his, his opening moment in that Wisconsin campaign was with you on your radio show. Uh, you were, you, uh, it was one of those interviews that I think everyone who heard it really re remembers. You, you simply kept stopping him on everything he said to you that you thought was untrue, uh, marking it as untrue. You kind of hung in there with him in that interview and set down what it seemed to me were the kinds of principles to use in in both discussing uh, uh, the issues with Donald Trump and in your case trying to stop him in your state. Well, this is a target-rich environment for anyone in the media who questions Donald Trump, because all you have to do is drill down on any one of his positions, and what you're going to find out is that there's no there there. And yeah, I mean, um, I do think it's political malpractice that uh, Republicans have waited this long to be able to confront the disgrace that Donald Trump represents, the disaster he represents. I think they've been out of touch. I think Steve Schmidt is right when he says that the Republican establishment had suffered from affluenza. But the reality is that the Republican Party 
Party cannot nominate Donald Trump if it wants to preserve any sort of intellectual, principled, conservative integrity. This is one of those existential threats, not just to the conservative movement, not just to the Republican Party, but to actually, you know, anyone who follows presidential politics. And, and that's why this, whether it's a movement or not, why this is not going to go away anytime soon. Steve, I'm going to ask you as a strategist uh, throughout the program to, to wear different hats. At some point, I'm mm -hmm. going to ask you to wear the Trump campaign hat and what they should be doing in terms of delicate stuff. But for the moment, wear the Stop Trump hat for a second. When should a Stop Trump movement have started? And what, if it could have run this whole thing over again, what would it have, what should it have done differently? I think that there is a profound disconnect in Washington, D.C., among the establishment, the leaders of the Republican Party with regard to the impact of the Great Recession, the economic collapse on Republican voters. So we look in the seventh year of the Obama presidency, but we also look at that in the context of eight years of a Bush presidency and even before that. Wage stagnation for blue collar working Americans. Haven't seen a wage increase in 20 years low economic growth. The devastating cultural impact of the Great Recession is people lost their homes, they lost their savings, they lost their retirements, and the party has had no policies to remedy it. And so sometime when we voted to repeal Obamacare for the 45th or the 50th yeah. time, these voters said, this is all kabuki theater. Yeah. It's play fighting. So we have this severability between conservatism and issues. And the test of who's a conservative, and it has been for some time in the party, hasn't been on the intellectual basis or the policy basis that Charlie Sykes talked about. It's who has fidelity to the person usually with the most incendiary rhetoric. And if you look at Trump's tone in this campaign, this tone shouldn't be surprising to anybody who's listened to talk radio and to some of the most celebrated talk radio hosts mm -hmm. in the country over the last 10 to 15 years. This is where somebody running for when, when Mark Levin has a caller he disagrees with, he famously told her to find a gun in the house, point it to her head and blow her brains out. We've seen this for a long time coming and the dismantling of the inner intellectual architecture of the conservative movement has been building over the last decade and more. So, uh, Charlie, what, what's your response to that? I, I mean, this is, Steve is taking the Stop Trump movement back a couple of years. If you really wanted to stop Trump, you were going to have to start before 2015. Well, he's probably right. You know, on the other hand, you know, it's and, and by the way, you know, once once we stop Trump, we can go back and we can do that kind of an autopsy. You know, you know, who, who was responsible for starting this prairie fire? You know, what kind of irresponsible rhetoric? But I do think that ultimately, though, you have to step back and say, look, it's one thing to lose an election. It's another thing to lose your soul. And right now, if the Republican Party nominates Donald Trump, it will fundamentally change everything it stands for. It will change itself for a generation. And Republican leaders will not be able to walk back from a Donald Trump nominee nomination and say, you know what, we really are a principled party. We really do care about uh, minorities, women. We do care about these, these ideas that we've claimed to care about. If they embrace Donald Trump, they will have shown themselves to be absolutely and completely cynical about all the things they claimed to believe in. Now, see, he's right when he talks about the disconnect between the problems that, uh, you know, um, average working Americans have Experience, but this is a little bit like, you know, um, treating treating a heart attack by, you know, Ebola. You know, the the answer to these problems is not Donald Trump. And I think that's where Republicans have to make the case. The issues are legitimate. The candidate is not. Ken Blackwell, uh, please reply to, to Steve's point that the there was a vacuum, a policy vacuum in the Republican Party on economic policy uh, as regards middle class interests that Donald Trump was able to step into. Well, I don't think there was necessarily a, a policy disconnect. I think it was an inability to deliver on promises, even when we had the, the, the numbers. I, I think the, the, the policy was there, but the will to follow through was not there. And that has created uh, a, a disruption between the leadership of the party uh, and, and, and the base. And so whether or not... Uh, Mr. Trump is the solution to it is the issue b b before us. I don't think that he, that he is, and I would agree with everyone who has spoken so far about the existential threat that Mr. Trump 
actually poses to principal conservative uh, leadership and, and thoughtful policies that are under are the undergirding of uh, American exceptionalism. Lindsay, uh, normally long before the convention, there is a presumptive nominee, John McCain, uh, Mitt Romney, who, who's in a position to begin to take control of the convention and decide what's going to happen at that convention, how it's going to look, including who's going to speak when, that sort of thing. If we do not have a presumptive Republican nominee going into the convention, who is in control of that convention? So as it's happened every convention the, 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 prior, you will have, you'll get to a convention the first day and they will meet and they'll elect a temporary chair. And then once the delegation's in place and they've gone through the rules committee and the credentialing and the platform and the permanent organization, then they will elect the permanent chair. And that's how the process has always been. And this convention will be the same way. And we are preparing for two scenarios right now. We have two candidates who could viably make it to 1237 or we could end up in an open convention. But regardless of the outcome, we will be prepared Prepared, and this process will go off smoothly and the RNC will be here to facilitate and work with the convention committee to make sure that we come out of Cleveland united as a party with a nominee. Lindsay Walters, thank you very much for joining us and good luck remaining Switzerland between now and the convention.